Okay, welcome to class, everybody. <laughs> Happy Friday. Okay, we're just going to spend the first 10 minutes wrapping up chapter 12. Then we're going to move to sustainability, and that's, I think, going to be the last chapter that we cover. And it probably will not be tested on, on the final exam. So this is really the last thing that could potentially be on the exam is today's stuff. Um, that said, I do expect you guys to come on Monday um, for the rest of the discussion on sustainability. Um, and then Wednesday, we will obviously be weighing the final crystals, so you need to bring those into class. Um, we'll be doing a few other things. Uh, for one, we're going to be actually filling out course evaluations right then. So if you bring a computer, I'm going to leave at the end of the class, and you guys can fill out course evaluations. We're trying to get higher participation rates in those. College-wide is something we're working on. So the last day of class, we'll do that. Um, I have a room scheduled on reading day for a final exam review. That's going to be this Friday. It's going to be, I think, in the room next to us. I'll watch for an announcement about that. That's already scheduled. Um, okay, so the last little bit of this chapter is as follows. We got to the very end and we said, you know, in the olden days when they were making capacitors, they weren't very good, right? Um, if you looked at the dielectric constant, they were really low. For most polymers, it's like four. Ceramics, it's maybe three or ten. And they were really excited about things like clay that were, you know, maybe four or five times better than that, but still pretty awful. And this is why capacitors had to be so big to store lots of charge in them. And then along comes the titanates, right? And the titanates go from these tiny values, what is that, like four orders of magnitude larger, just an explosion in terms of like how much more charge they allow us to store. So what's so special about these class materials that we call the titanates, and there's other ones, right, that allow them to have such an enormous dielectric constant, right? So dielectric constant, if we go back, um, the reason why some things can store more charge than others is because we get polarization. The, the molecules or the atoms or the crystal, it can be polarized. And a polarization is a charge multiplied by a separation, right? So in water molecules, they weren't super amazing because if you start with water molecule, oxygen, hydrogen, um, oxygen's slightly more electronegative, and so it's going to have a slight charge difference. And these will have a slight charge difference on that side. So this is what we call a dipole. But it's not a big difference in charge. This is like a fractional difference in charge, right? Because the oxygen just wants the electrons a little bit more, so they're a little bit closer. So that's not a big charge. And if you want a big dipole, right, the polarization is equal to the charge times the distance. So in order to get a larger polarization, we can do two things. You can either get more charge. Instead of dealing with fractions of an electron, what if you dealt with... In like large numbers of electrons that can move, right? Or you could move them a bigger distance, right? The polarization could be larger in terms of the physical separation. And that's where titanates take off, right? Is they do both of those things a little bit better. So if we go down and look at them, this is barium titanate. Barium titanate's an incredibly important material. Um, it's a perovskite. You can tell that by looking at the structure, right? It's cubic for one thing above a certain temperature, above 120 degrees Celsius, it's cubic. And you can see that the orange atoms are on the corners of this lattice, the red ones are on the faces, and then this tiny orange one is in the center, right? We know about the perovskite lattice, the perovskite crystal structure, is that it has the formula ABO3, where A is your larger cation. That could be something like a rare earth, like a barium, right? Something that's large. And then your B is your smaller cation, and that's going to be titanium in this, in this case. Titanium is only like a third row element, so it's already smaller. But if you actually do the math on this, let's figure out what's the charge on these things. For barium titanate, what would be the charge on this? Let's pull up a periodic table and see what it ought to be. Barium titanate. Um, if you look at it on the periodic table... Look where barium is and look where titanate, tit titanium is. Barium's right here. It's a group two. Titanium's a group four, right? You know that in this structure you've got three oxygens, so that negative six coming from the oxygens needs to be canceled out by a positive six coming from those two. And looking at the periodic table, it's obvious how you're going to get to that positive six with one barium and one titanium. You're going to take barium, it's going to lose both of its electrons, become barium two plus, whereas titanium's going to become... 4 plus, right? When something becomes 4 plus, it's getting really small. The more and more electrons you, you, that you strip off of this thing, you don't lose your positive nucleus charges. And so with less and less electrons, they really start to hang on to your remaining electrons even more. So it's going to shrink quite a bit. So titanium, 
4 plus is a really small ion. It's really small. That's why it's going to fit in the middle of this structure, which is octahedrally coordinated. It's surrounded by six oxygens, as opposed to sitting on the corners, which are dodecahedral coordination. They've got 12 nearest neighbors, so that's a big site. So barium's definitely going to sit on these corners. Titanium's going to sit in the middle. Oxygen on the faces. So how does this give us a big polarization? In the cubic structure, it doesn't. In the cubic structure, the positives and negatives are all perfectly balanced out. But there's a, there's a temperature where it switches from cubic to tetragonal. Tetragonal, you'll remember, if we go from cubic to tetragonal, here's our cubic. And in cubic, the A lattice parameter is the same in all three of those directions. But in tetragonal, then it's, I'm going to draw it super exaggerated. It's not this much. Then you've got A and A down here, but that's different than B, right? Yeah, question, Sam? Um, is that true for all perovskites or just the um, Good question. It's a common thing to happen with perovskites that there is a temperature at which they will switch from cubic to non-cubic. Now, what type of non-cubic can vary a little bit? Um, this is tetragonal that we've shown here. There can be other variations. It can be orthorhombic. That means that A and A are no longer the same. And that's not the same as that. So all three of these are different. That can happen. Um, but it's a common trait. I'll say that. And what, how does this happen? Like, what actually occurs here? Um, first off, I've drawn it, like, really exaggerated. I've drawn, like, this as, like, a really big difference. But it can be small. So what are some typical values? So shown right here. Um, in barium titanate, you might get lattice parameters that look like this. You've got 3.98, 3.98, and then 4.03. So, you know, a few percent larger. How does it achieve this? If you were to zoom in on it and look at it from the side, it might look something like this. Okay? Your oxygens, which used to be centered on the faces, they're going to shift a little bit. In fact, let's draw the A having not shifted. The A cation, let's assume that it didn't shift position. But we're going to draw the B cation, our titanium, that it's shifted upwards, right? So from the halfway position, maybe it shifted up some position, right? And then your oxygens, which we'll draw in maybe purple, they can also shift, right? Instead of being located perfectly at this halfway position like that, they can be shifted up or down. So let's shift those down a little bit. Okay? And your A cation can also be shifted, right? It depends on each crystal system, how these things shift a little bit. But basically what you're seeing is that the positively charged ones, this thing is 4 plus, these things are 2 plus, these ones are 2 minus. The positives in the electric field are going to shift one direction, and your negative ones are going to shift another direction. And so per unit cell, you can go ahead and start adding these things up. You can say, OK, the way that I drew it here, A atom didn't shift, so nothing there. But my total polarization, my total polarization is going to be equal to a sum of the charge times its separation, right? So let's just go element by element. Let's assume that the A site didn't shift. So A um, was nothing. That was a 2 plus charge, but it's multiplied by a 0 meter shift. Okay. But let's look at B and the oxygen. The B site, well, that's a 4 plus charge. And let's say that it moved up. So we're going to call that a positive x direction that it shifted up. Maybe some distance, right? So let's call that... Um, I don't know. I don't want to put a number out. Let's just call it like delta, a positive delta number in meters. And then your oxygen, it's a minus 2. It's a negative ion. And it's shifting down. So it's minus some gamma position in meters. right? So to figure out the total polarization, you just need to figure out how many atoms are there. Well, there's three oxygens per unit cell. There's one barium, and there's one um, of your A site. You would add all these things up. The positive charge gets multiplied by a positive shift. The negative is going to get multiplied by a negative. So it accounts for that. And your total polarization is going to be something you can account for in this. Okay? And what happens is the fact that this titanium is 4 plus, it's carrying 4 electrons worth of charge, and it can move a significant amount, you can get a huge polarization. Right? Now, why can it move so much? Why is it possible for that titanium to move so much? The reason why is because it's too small 
for the site that it's in. If we look at the crystal cell, like the crystal structure, I'm going to draw the octahedra. Like, again, the oxygens are sitting on these faces, right? So they form this sort of octahedral thing like that. And your barium's inside of that, okay? That is too large for the titanium. Sorry, you're not, I, I meant to say your titanium is sitting inside of that, not your barium. It's too small, and so that thing can rattle around. It can be moved in the presence of an electric field, okay? Any questions on why this is why titanium titanates, I should say, have such a large dielectric constant? Let me ask you this. If you had to predict another material that had a, a large polarization, what might it be, right? Barium titanate definitely does. What else might have a really high polarization in the perovskite crystal structure? Maybe turn to your neighbor and discuss for one second. Okay, almost done. Okay, what do you think? Clearly, barium titanate's awesome. In fact, any perovskite where the titanium is 4 plus on that B site is a pretty good uh, dielectric, has a large polarization. What else might work? What do you guys think? Yeah, Ashton, what do you think? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't think it does, and the reason why is because carbon tends to be more of a covalent bonding ion. These tend to be ionic ones. Ionic meaning that you really want them to surrender the electron um, entirely. And then also the other reason is once they do, like, they, they share. Covalent bonds share the electron, so they both want it equally afterwards, and you're left with a strong, rigid bond, whereas ionic ones, the ions can shift. Once they've given up their electron and, and traded it with somebody else, they don't really care what happens with it. But a carbon bonded with another carbon, it cares where those electrons go, so they're not going to be able to shift very much. So I think you're on the right line of thought, but um, I don't think that they'd be able to move very much, so... Nope, I don't think carbon's a good one. What else? Well, it's always a good idea to say, well, what's below titanium, right? <laughs> what's on the same row? The zirconates, same thing. Barium zirconate, it's a great dielectric. Zirconium can also go 4 plus, right? Lose all its electrons, it becomes pretty small. It's another one. Any other thoughts? What do you think? Yeah, so now aluminum tends to be 3 plus rather than 4 plus which means your A site can't be barium anymore because barium's going to be 2 plus. So what might be on the other site? Um, maybe like lanthanum. Lanthanum goes 3 plus, so you could have lanthanum aluminate. The aluminum is going to be small. It's going to sit in the octahedral site. It's going to be polarizable. You should be able to get a large polarization out of that, right? You could do other things. You could do like, um, you could do tantalum, which is going to be 5 plus if you remove all of its electrons, and put it with a 1 plus, right? You could do like, lithium tantalate, or like cesium tantalate. And again, you'd expect a pretty high polarizability with those. Okay, any questions on this, on how you calculate the polarization on these? There's a uh, YouTube video, if you want to watch it, where I go through all the mathy details of it with some real numbers, if you want to watch that. Okay? All right, we're almost out of time, and I want to turn it over to them, but I'll just say a couple things more about this, that this, the temperature at which you go from cubic to tetragonal is called the Curie temperature, after, like, named after Madame Marie Curie. Sladowska? Sladowska? Whatever her name, last name is, right? That's the Curie temperature. And what that means is that there's a temperature all on its own, without you messing with the material at all, where it will go from... It starts out at this at room temperature, for example, and when you heat it up, it will turn into this. And when you cool it down, it will do this. And what that really means is that it goes from having the atoms perfectly centered symmetrically at high temperatures, and when you cool it down, they automatically shift, right? All on their own, the atoms say, hey, it's lower energy for me to shift. The oxygens might go down, the titanium and the barium might go up, okay? But it doesn't mean that that will happen all the way through your material. In fact, it's going to happen in small what we call domains. So if, like, Elias here is an individual unit cell of barium titanate, and you decide to shift your titanium that direction, go ahead and do that. So, like, stick an arm out. So he's got, like, positive charge impinging on the unit cell, which is Avery. So Avery's like, 
that's too much positive. I don't like that. So he's going to stick his positive out that way and stick negative out this way, right? So see how it, like, it's going to like affect the unit cells nearby it? So go ahead and stick arms out this way, you guys, this whole row. Right? But maybe back there, starting with like Bryce, he had a different idea, like this, this domain nucleated, right? It's just like another nucleation event, but maybe you stuck yours out like forward, right? And that influenced, oh, I forgot your name. Sorry, Jackson. Right? So see how there can be like these, it's not a grain boundary, right? This whole reason is, this whole region of students might be like in the same crystallographic orientation. But when this ferroelectric shift happens, you can have slight displacement of atoms, and they're going to be clumped together because individual unit cells affect one another. You can put your arms down. Thanks so much. Right? So we call that a domain. Or in other words, domains are smaller than grain boundaries, right? They can be as large as a grain boundary. If all of the students in this whole section were unit cells and they all got polarized in the same direction, great. Then the domain is the same size as the grain boundary, but that doesn't have to be the case. Okay? Um, so if you want a material that is going to store lots and lots of charge, what you want is you want every one of the domains to be polarized in the same direction. Because we just said that like, if they start in different directions, they might be pointing different ways. And that's not useful for devices. We want them to be all pointing the same direction in our domains. So how do we do that? One way to do that is with a process called polling. And polling, if we were to draw this, if I was looking at the, you know, the structure of these things with a bunch of grain boundaries, right? If I let this thing cool down on its own, a bunch of polarizations will occur probably in random directions, right? But now imagine if I do this, if I cool it down, and this time I'm going to have sort of the same kind of grain boundaries, but because I'm going to cool it down, I'm going to apply an electric field. If I apply an electric field on this thing while I cool it down, then it shouldn't be random which way these things point. They should all be pointing aligned with the electric field. So I might be able to align all of my domains of my ferroelectric domains, which is, again, these are all just regions of shifted atoms, slight shifts of atoms that creates polarization all in the same direction. And if you want a good capacitor, then you want to do that. You want them all as aligned as possible. And again, the trick to doing it is as you cool it down from above the Curie temperature, and again, the Curie temperature above that, it's cubic, so there is no polarization, which really just means that what does that really mean? It means that on average, the titanium is just jumping around between all the available positions, and it's not staying anywhere, right? That's in, that's in the cubic crystal structure, so that on average, it's still located right in the center. But when you cool it down, it's going to stick in one of those spots, and you can tell it which spot to stick in by applying an electric field, right? So that's called polling. Um, so the last thing I'll say about this before turning the time over is that you can make incredible devices out of this. I mean, absolutely incredible. Imagine for a minute um, that you've got this situation. You've got your, your unit cell, which is tetragonal. So it's got, let's, let's draw it like this. It's got a slight positive here and a negative there, right? That's the sort of, sort of polarization that achieved. Well, what if you apply an electric field to this thing and you can switch it, right? What if you switch it? What if you apply an electric field and you reverse it? That becomes memory, Right? Whether you store positive here and negative here, or negative there and positive there, that's memory. That's like flash memory, right? That's pretty incredible as it is. But you can do other things. What if you squeeze this thing, right? Literally, like this is a longer axis and this is a shorter axis. What if I come in and I squeeze this thing, right? If I do that, then this will occur, where that's either negative and that's positive, or vice versa. So what this is, and this is so important, is that this is a coupling which is unexpected. You're coupling a mechanical force, right? Your signal is mechanical. You're squeezing on it. But what you're getting out of it is an electrical response. So you're coupling, elect mag you're coupling mechanics with electronics, right? So this is what we call multiferroics. A multiferroic, and I promise I'll end, a multiferroic material is one that couples different things together, right? So, for example, uh, this is not showing the one that we want. Uh, ferroelectric. Actually, it is right here. Yeah, ferroelectric. That's us. We're coupling a the polarization, which is the electric one, um, and you can couple that with magnet. Let's actually find a better picture of this. Um, this is maybe a better one, right? We have different fields that we can apply to things. You can apply an electric field. We can apply a strain field, or we can apply a magnetic field. 
And there are certain classes of materials that will respond to one field with something unexpected. If you apply an electric field, maybe you get a magnetic change, a change in the magnetic moment. That would be a magnetoelectric. There are other ones where you apply a field and you get a change in the mechanical response. Those are your piezoelectric or ferroelastic materials. And up top they've got, you apply a, mag, uh, a mechanical strain and you get a change in the magnetism. Those are magnetoelastic, right? So these multi and ferroic just means that it has some sort of coupling. So multi means you have multiple types of coupling that can interact with one another. They make amazing, amazing devices possible. Go back to this one. If I squeeze on this and there's a change in the polarization, think of what you could do with that, right? So I've listed a whole bunch of them. You can make pick, like pickups on your guitar. The vibration from the, the string vibrating, right? You could take that physical strain and you could couple that into an electrical signal, right? This thing actually vibrating, switching between those two states is going to change the polarization. That's an electrical signal, right? So you can make pickups. This is how ultrasound works. Ultrasound, when you look at tiny babies in the womb or you explore the ocean floor, they're taking a physical wave, right? A wave of compression is traveling through some medium. It's going to hit the baby's head and bounce back to the receiver. And that physical wave, to be able to turn into some sort of image, we need to turn it into an electrical signal. So you have piezoelectric materials that take that, that pressure wave, that, that mechanical force, turn it into a signal, and then we can image with it. If this sounds like magic, it's because it basically is. <laughs> and none of you seem excited about it, but this is amazing stuff, right? And you can make so much more. You can make sensors. You can make really cool things. I think I mentioned last time that you can make very, um, really carefully controllable linear stages. If you want to move things in a really careful way, um, you can only go so small in terms of force, but we can go really small in terms of voltage. We know how to reduce voltage to tiny amounts, and if a tiny voltage is applied, maybe that will produce a very small shift in terms of like the strain that you produce. Things like that allows us to make really sensitive motors. So I'm going to stop and turn it over to sustainability. Um, so this will be the last thing you guys will be tested on.